Hello everyone, it is Monday the 29th of May. Welcome to the final episode of the D3D Thor Football Podcast dedicated to all things Leagues 1 and 2. The review of the final two games of the EFL season, the playoff finals at Wembley Stadium. I am delighted to say that for this very last episode, the full crew are here. All five of us are on this call to discuss these two games and reflect on D3 Diesel football as a whole as the several years that it has been running. It is myself, Edward Walker, joined by David Jenkin, Chris Stringer, Harry Thomas and James Richards, the world's finest five-a-side team. I think we could all agree. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Don't see, I did think about this actually the other day. I remember someone asking me, if we were a five-a-side team, where would we play? And I kind of thought about it and then thought, you know, we'd probably be like Dutch total football and just play wherever we fancy. We'd just <laughs> change as we go along. I reckon we'd be brilliant at it. I had a wonderful season in Liverpool playing as a goalkeeper in a there five-a-side Chris team. in goal, we'll all just rotate outside of it. Perfect. <laughs> I'd like to play the Peter Clark role. I'll, I'll be the rock at the back until the final five minutes and then I'll hang by the other goal. <laughs> I'll be wherever I'll... I do the least running. <laughs> That's normally at the back. Old man, yeah. Stick yeah, up top of the target, man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. not, I'm not going to be the target man let's put it that way I'm not tall, I'm nowhere near big enough to be one of those <laughs> mind before we get going of course this podcast is in partnership with The Big Step which tackles football's relationship with gambling there is an excessive presence of gambling adverts within football and The Big Step continue to do great work to raise awareness about the dangers of gambling and the impact it can have on so many people's lives James Big Step partnership we've had for two seasons now I think with this pod yeah yeah I'm very pleased that, that we, we sort of reached out to them and said, look, we'd, we'd be interested in partnering with them. I think, um, but I don't, people will gamble and that's entirely up to adults. This is not about that. And I think people have sometimes misunderstood that. It's about, there is no need for football to be inundated with gambling, advertising everywhere. And it was taking over in a way that I felt very uncomfortable about. And uh, if the Ivan Tony situation hasn't highlighted mm-hmm. just how toxic this is and how indeed damaging it can be for individuals having to be forced to promote mm-hmm. gambling, I think nothing will ever do so more poignantly and um, I'm just pleased that we've we've been able to sort of buck the trend because unfortunately nearly every podcast I listen to and I'm a big ice hockey fan and it's kind of creeping in very very quickly into Canadian and North American markets now with the, the relaxation of gambling rules everything is now inundated with a betting partner you know everyone is promoting gambling and I just feel slightly uncomfortable with that because I know it has a, a massive impact on some people those who have had addiction problems you know, you, you see people try to belittle them and say that, that it's due to human weakness. That's nonsense. If you, if you know anyone who's ever suffered from addiction, you know, it's nothing to do with that at all. And I just think football should stay and remain free from the the gambling adverts, which have been quite harmful to, to some people. And I just I hope that we see um, a strong hand from the people in charge to, to sort of ban it. I know that there is um, this talk of front uh, of shirt sponsorship. From gambling companies now being banned, which I'm all behind, and I hope that seeps down. And really, um, I know it's it's difficult financially for clubs in the EFL, especially those in our divisions. But I really hope, um, as we've seen with the Palaces at Tranmere, you know, you don't have to accept that money. There is another option. There is another way to go. And I'm uh, I'm pleased that they've done that. And I I'm pleased for t- teams like Forest Green as well. I have to say they've advocated for this as well. So. I just hope everyone gets on board and, and we see an end to it as soon as possible. At the underscore big step on Twitter is where you can find them. The work they do really is incredible. They highlight such dangers that we've touched on before and they touch on all the time. It has been so good to be able to be partnered with them these last couple of years and it's always felt a great thing for us to do. Let's get going and we'll begin with the world's best third tier. League One. League One. Playoff final, boys. Barnsley nil, Sheffield Wednesday one. After extra time, should have known. Final episode. I really thought we were going to get through this weekend of playoff finals without having any major controversy, but no. <laughs> More on that to come very shortly. I will kick off, though, with the team news for this game. Barnsley were unchanged. It was a third game in a row with the same starting 11. Harry Eisted in goal. Liam Kitching, Mads Anderson and Bobby Thomas storming the back three. Nicky Cadden playing at left wing back. Jordan Williams at right wing back. Herbie Kane, Luca Connell and Adam Phillips the midfield three. Slobodan Tedic and Devante Cole the starting front line. Shelter Wednesday also unchanged. They had the same team which began that historic second leg at Hillsborough. That incredible comeback. Cameron Dawson in goal. 
behind the trio of Reese James, Michael Iekwe and Dominic Iortha, Marvin Johnson at left wing back, Callum Patterson at right wing back, Liam Palmer once again partnering Barry Bannon in midfield, Josh Windass behind the front pair of Michael Smith and Lee Gregory. The game, I suppose, really, we should we can probably skip through the first half quite quickly, I think, thinking about it back. There wasn't that much in it. It was a really high intensity start. Generally, though, I thought a very cage and scrappy affair for the first 45. A couple of important blocks to deny half decent chances of goal, and it went into half time nil nil. Second half, oh boy, <laughs> two incidents that we can dive into, lads, in very quick succession. Uh, first, a penalty call, and then a red card. I'll open the floor first for the penalty call against Lee Gregory. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I mean, I can see why everyone was screaming for it to be given as a pen. <laughs> But I would be, a slight, if, it, if that was my team, I'd be a bit annoyed at it being given. Yep. But, you know, you can't argue too much if it was. Either way, this was a, a very close call. But I personally thought that would have been, I'd have been annoyed if that was my team who, who that would have been called against, to be honest. These kinds of incidents, they really do annoy me, these situations, because... I remember seeing it back at Lee Gregory in my head. Lee Gregory's intent is purely for the ball to get onto the clear and to clear it outside the box. And it just so happens that he accidentally ends up kicking a Barnsley man. I can't recall the top of my head which Barnsley man that is that he ends up kicking. But I remember incidents I've seen like this in before where penalties have been given. And you're, you're just doing your job inside the box, clearing your lines. And someone runs across you and you accidentally end up kicking them and give away a penalty for that. It's just never really set right with me that that is something that can be given unless there's it's not like a missed time challenge is it it's yeah. actually a bit of a 50 50 really isn't it i mean yeah. it, the, the ball's coming in from high they both swing their feet at it one gets to it a fraction of a second early but they 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 basically collide with each other they kick each other don't they almost i mean so, I really yeah, feel I'm, like... sort of, I'm sort of with you james I'd, I'd be annoyed if it wasn't given against me but i also i totally understand why it's not been given and then why but on a var check it's also not been given I think it's not kind clear of and obvious, also... is it? That's that's the thing. It's it's just not a clear. It, it's not like someone slid in, not got the ball and taken the man. It's not clear and obvious. And this one is, you know, where I just think you can understand why it wasn't. Yeah. Why it wasn't. I feel like it goes down to intent as well, though. For for me, every time you look at that highlight, his eyes are on the ball the whole time. There's clearly no intent. There's no look towards the man to try and injure. There's no, you know, <clears throat> it's very easy to say that you know it's intent penalty should... straight off, but. For intent me, doesn't really matter, though, does it? I mean, no, I uh, suppose not. But he's looking at the ball the whole time. The focus is clearly on playing the ball. It's clearly not on playing the man. And I just find those kind of situations, if you're going to penalise someone for defending, I feel like we do that enough as it is when, when you look at, you know, maybe kind of the VAR in the higher divisions, but also some of the decisions in uh, across the time that we've done this podcast, at least. Where you I, see I do hate the decisions. VAR stuff in the top divisions where, you know, you're looking at split second replays where someone just touches, like stands on the edge of someone's toe. And it's not something you'd notice in real time. It's the reaction of the players often very exaggerated. But because there's contact, I mean, mm. the prime example, I suppose, Chris, would be the, is it the Missalu one in the FA Cup? I've, I've, I've never given that one <laughs> yeah but that's that's the problem isn't it and that's that's why i hate var because that was just nonsense that's never a penalty ever I, I, I because think it, there was i think, it, I think it is starting to be used a little bit better though i think i think they are starting to get a grip of how to use it more this game for it to be used in i don't think the use of var was awful if i'm honest because var is there to just give the referee an opportunity to have a second mm. look at it and for them to decide whether they're going to have another look at it again themselves. Is the right? problem with VAR or is the problem with the people in control of the VAR? I, I would argue neither, it's I, to do with I, the officials. The quality of the officials, neither, we've I, already said, are terrible down here, haven't we? Like, it's never been great. I if think if people are misunderstanding what, what VAR is for. I think the, the point of VAR is to, if, if the referee has made a decision that is clear and obviously incorrect, it should overturn a decision. Whereas people are wanting VAR to go and make the decisions for the referee, which is not what it should be. Well, the be referees have been doing that themselves, haven't they? They've been, a lot of the time, they have been letting VAR make their decisions yes, for them. And I absolutely. think that's been problematic. And it's kind of stopped the rhythm uh, in, in football in the, in the Premier League. I saw it was a Bournemouth game against someone, and there was a clear five minute gap between the foul being uh, committed and a penalty being awarded. And I just thought, this is nonsense. You know, and it wasn't even a clear and obvious issue. I think, I think the ref gave it. He made him made him look back at it 
only for him to give give it. I mean, I just, I just like, and I don't actually agree with VAR being used in the League One or League Two playoff no, final it when shouldn't. it's not been used in a single match up until that point during the competitive campaign because it's just. You know, where's the consistency in that? That's just it, it, it's the same arguments I make in the FA Cup. You, you you can't pick and choose what what game you use it for. I think for League One and Two, it, it, either you implement it at every ground in the division, or you don't use it at all, at all including the playoffs. For the yeah, FA you can't Cup. have games in the FA Cup in the say you're all playing in the fourth round, for example. And some games in the fourth round yeah. have VAR, and some don't. You either have it for the entirety of that round of of tight matches or you yeah, don't you, have it so, I mean it's just football's become you, you, you bring it in for the, for the quarterfinals <laughs> onwards or something or don't use it at all yeah absolutely well absolutely. Yeah. VAR was not done because a few minutes later it's called upon again to potentially reverse a red card decision on Adam Phillips and it doesn't reverse the decision a terrible decision <laughs> awful. Yeah. awful awful I had a feeling we'd agree on this one <laughs> you, I'd genuinely love to hear how many Sheffield Wednesday fans even think that that should have been a straight red card. I think it's it's absolutely baffling. I mean, I personally thought it it should have been a penalty going back to the previous incident. I agree. I don't. I think the VAR did the right thing, not overturning it, because I agree with what you said that it wasn't clear and obvious. But in my head, and this is one of the big issues that I think we have with referees, the referee maybe either felt that he'd made the wrong decision with the penalty in hindsight, or at the very least, was conscious of the fact that he had a big decision to make that was going to polarise people. And then the next opportunity comes in to make a big call and he panics and he goes straight for the red card. And I don't know whether you guys agree, but I feel like we see it happen quite a lot in football where a referee either misses something uh, or gives something that's a bit contentious and then they try to overcorrect. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it actually, funnily enough, it happened in a hockey game where they had a hot mic situation where a referee had given a bad call to one team and he was caught when he gave a penalty against the other team. A penalty in hockey is different from football. It's like where someone gets sent off for, for a two minute power play. But he, he sent a guy off for two minutes and he was caught on the mic saying, oh, I just gave that because I wanted to even things up for my earlier mistake. And it went viral and the guy was sacked and never allowed to ref again. And, mm. But the overarching... What's, what's kind of interesting, actually, going slightly off topic, I'm talking about my cup. Um, I've been watching the Under-20 World Cup, which is in Argentina recently. You can catch on Theta Plus, the group games. And the VAR, they have the referees mic'd up, reviewing their decisions. That's good. Which yeah, like, why can't we have that like we do in rugby? Like, well, rugby's I, always had mics, hasn't it, for the referees, as far as I can remember. I, I, don't, I, don't think the, I don't think it was a red card, but I don't think it's as terrible a decision as you guys are making out. I can see why he's given it as a red. Because I, guy- I think context comes in, Chris, so that's where I disagree with you. Because I think the context is that after 48 games in the season, if you're going to send a player off in a playoff final, you must be sure that you're making that correct decision. And he had, the thing is, he had the opportunity to have a quick look at it again. No, yeah, and I think it, if he it, had looked at it again, he'd have seen, actually, that's never a red card in a month of Sundays. No, right. I have to say, no, because that's, if that's where my difficulty is, though, is the fact that I don't necessarily have the difficulty with the card being given. My difficulty is with the fact that the VAR monitor's there. He has the opportunity, Tim Robinson has the opportunity to go and have a look, but he doesn't even bother. No, he looks... It, if, if, if he's, you know, the, the, the lad's got in pretty wild two-footed off the ground. Well, now, not two-footed, though, was it? One foot went no, in. No, he's, he's back retracted behind. the other foot back. The, the foot uh, strikes across. Still, I can still, understand it's it, a bit high, but it's, it's not still red, flailing, it? It's still flailing about pretty uncontrolled. Uh, he's given the red card. He then gets on the mic to the, to the um, was it two or three officials in the bar room that uh, have looked at it back and said, yep, you're justified in giving a red card. Why does he need to go and look at the monitor? If he's already pretty sure in his decision and two or three other people have confirmed that what he's done is reasonable, why would he go to see the how monitor? everyone else, like 95% of the people who've seen that have gone, that's never a red card. So I think that's where we disagree with that. I think that is a, a, a poor decision. I think you look at that challenge over and over again and I just can't see how it's a red card. And I just find it very difficult to justify, especially in such a huge game, which did kind of change the flow of the match. It made Barnsley have to sit back and cling on. And I think it made it a bit more open as well. It did actually. Yeah, it made, it, it made the game better for sure. But in terms of if you're Michael Duff, you you know you could see yeah. his reaction as soon as it was red card. You're thinking, you know, our season has kind of been hampered now by a decision which, you know, if the ref had had another look at it and still agreed with his decision, well, what can you say? But I just, ah, uh, I don't know. I just didn't think it was a red card. I'd be mad if that was a red card to one of my players in 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 a in a crunch game like this, you know. I like on this very last episode, we're all going to fall out over a red card. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, 
he was sent off. Barnsley went down to ten, and it it's I think so much credit really has to go to the Tykes how they played from that point on. From the fiftieth minute being down to ten men, they still took the game to Wednesday. Did have their opportunities, even though Wednesday had theirs. I remember Barnsley in the crossbar in the second half. We go through to extra time. Harry Eisted, what a performance from him in the goal. Some it's absolutely a strange story, though, isn't it, teams. Harry Eisted? Because he's come in to replace... All, uh, they had Brad Collins, who I thought was being, playing fantastic yeah. throughout the season for Barnsley. And the fact that he, he got injured and they brought Eisted in to come and play. And he sort of had a, he had a sort of slow... I, I mean, an unremarkable start. Maybe he wasn't really called in, but he's he's made that position his own. And, and to play as well as he did, I felt so, so sorry for him as that ball went past him in the mid, literally the last kick of the game. I mean, oh, he, yeah, he, he deserved was an opportunity. Man of the match, wasn't he? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Matt Anderson had a fantastic performance in front of him as well. Some really yeah. big blocks, especially in the second half of extra time. They'll struggle to keep hold of him, I think. There should be a lot of interest in championship club. I mean, for me, he's a championship defender. He got in the league one team of the season and deservedly so. He's he's so integral to that Barnsley team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Really good centre-back. But they could not keep them at bay because in the 123rd minute, Sheffield Wednesday score, Josh Windass. I didn't even realise he was still playing. I thought he'd come off. I hadn't seen him do really anything, I don't remember, up to that point. And he's yeah, on the I'm, end of a cross to power in no a header, idea. which I said just can't get a hold of. Maybe that's part of the reason he got the goal, because Barnsley forgot he was on the pitch as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, when he was celebrating, it's like, who the hell's that who's just scored that goal? I, I thought it was Gregory. I was expe- I just looked at the technique of the diving head and I thought, surely Gregory's done that. I don't think Gregory I've seen Windass. I don't think I've seen Windass head a ball before. No, his, his dad was quite handy. He played for Oxford for a for a season and, and obviously he scored that goal in that of course, uh, for Hull. In the final episode, he has to get the Oxford. He's got to get an Oxford rest of the season. You wait till League Two, David. <laughs> he, he, played, he, he played for Oldham briefly as well. <laughs> what, Dean Windass? Yeah, he did. Ah, yeah, that's bad. Is there I any didn't, Northern I didn't clubs he didn't play for, Dean Windass? I, I, think, I think it was one of his last clubs. He came, he, the, the season after he, he scored that goal at Wembley, he went on loan to Oldham. And I remember him, uh, our goalkeeper got sent off and he went in net against Leicester. Of course he did. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Dean Windass, no. There was a really nice interview after this game with Dean Windass wearing a very bright orange shirt there on the day, talking with his son about the game. Brilliant. I mean, Windass, Dean, the iconic goal for him, a whole city against Bristol City, down the other end of the Wembley pitch. So the Windass family have now got an iconic goal at either end of Wembley. They're basically <laughs> on the stadium now. We might as well yeah. call it Windass Wembley from now on. I did see a, a, a Latix fan um, complaining the other week when he saw that Josh, Josh Windass had been doing well at Sheffield Wednesday and said, David Unsworth has really messed up uh, not, not using him at Oldham. But other what year was that? 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 Well, that was, that was Jordan Windass. He's uh, his brother that was oh. on loan with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it wasn't him, was it? What a moment, though. 120 is minute. Basically, as, as close to the last second as you can get, really, right in front of the Wednesday end. James... Sheffield Wednesday, what a playoff campaign, seriously, because... Well, what a season, really. I mean, to finish on 96 points, firstly, is a remarkable total. And to not go up automatically, that is ridiculous. Then to be 4-0 down after the first leg of your playoff semi-final and find the the energy and the impetus to come back and beat Peterborough um, after turning it around with a 5-1 win and a penalty shootout... And then to really have to keep going right until the last kick of the game at Wembley and score with the final kick of the entire EFL season. It's, it's not a bad way to, you know, Sheffield Wednesday fans have had some tough times. I think this season has kind of given them just that little bit of uh, respite and they'll they'll remember this one for a long time to come, as I'm sure all of us will as well. Does it not feel kind of fitting in a way that this incredible League One season we've had, where we've had Plymouth Hockey I'll pick 101 points, Ipswich 98, Sheffield Wednesday 96... Does it not feel fitting kind of to a way that it is ultimately those three that they're going to go into the championship next season? Yeah, that's why ultimately, despite me feeling completely gutted for Barnsley, mm-hmm. I don't really have a problem with Sheffield Wednesday going up. In fact, I thought remarkably, if you looked at the three EFL divisions, none of the sides that went up, it felt like they didn't deserve it. Like you sometimes get one side sneak in late with a run in the playoffs and they get promoted and you think, oh, that's harsh on the team that finished, you know, third or fourth, depending on the division. But no, this year I, I had absolutely... Like none, none of that. I thought all th- all of the teams in League Two that went up deserved it, and all the teams in League One that went up certainly deserved it. You can't argue against Sheffield Wednesday deserving that after that absolute monstrous season in which they would have probably won the title if it wasn't for just such craziness from Plymouth and Ipswich. So, yeah. has anyone seen the Championship liner by the way for next year? It looks. It gives me serious Coca-Cola crazy. vibes. 
from like the late 2000s, early 2010s when Coca-Cola were the league sponsor. Yeah, Coca-Cola. great yeah. mix of teams. Leeds in there, Southampton in there, Leicester, Argyle. You've got to assume that Leeds against Sheffield Wednesday is going to be the Friday night fixture to open the season, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. God, I, I live in Leeds. That's going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a shame Sheffield United all in there as well. That'd be really good. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I think Sheffield Wednesday would have felt even more hard done by if they hadn't got through today, if, considering their rivals did get through to the Premier League. Um, that would that would have been an interesting time in Sheffield had had both teams not been promoted this year. Yeah, definitely. And you talk about how open the how good the championships look in next season are, but how open is League One looking? With oh, I'm glad we're getting onto this. Up. I think that's the one thing that you can say for Barnsley is if they hold on to the likes of Anderson, if they can hold on to Michael Duff, they're going to be a, a real force next season in a division that's going to be so hard to call. Yeah, I'm just I'm just hopeful that Oxford can find some sort of strike force and just have a decent go because I can't take another season like this for from a from a relegation battle perspective. But one thing I'd say before we go on though, um Kenilworth Road in the Premier League is something I'm so happy to see. <laughs> it's just Can you believe that away end's gonna be there? It's just wonderful. It's a great That's away end. It's not just the away end though, remember they they've got a stand of boxes on one side of the pitch. No, there's not even <laughs> any seats. It's just exactly boxes to one side. I think there used to be benches in one of the stands that were slightly angled. I just love all every every single person tweeting. Can you believe this away end is going to be there? Yes, because that's their ground, and they were. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's wonderful. I mean, Oxford had the man of ground, of course, in the old first division, but this is a different era of football. Like completely, we're in a, a time of huge commercial uh, sort of aesthetics, aren't we? With Premier League football, the clubs have these massive stadiums. The Premier League have such stringent rules about how the pitch has to look and how the Cameras have to be positioned to get maximum exposure of all the commercial stuff. Kenilworth Road is in the Premier League, and it's just a ramshackle ground from a, from a time <laughs> gone past. I love it. I absolutely something love like it. ten million they're going to have to spend in order to get it up to the Premier League's uh, standards as well. Yeah, isn't you it? see like, how much they're getting for this playoff final win, and over the course of oh, this season, the most expensive, mo- most valuable game game in football. I think. I think I've the, seen the, Kieran what... Maguire say they're getting as much this next season as they have in the last eighteen years. Yeah, it's, that's it's Premier League wow. football for you. That's, the, the, wow. the Championship playoff final is the most valuable one-off game in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was between Coventry and, and it was between Coventry and Luton who we, Sides that we we've it. discussed not, on this podcast. It's soon, incredible so how big the ride's been. Yeah, it's brilliant. It really, brilliant. It really, you have to look at it as a lower league side and think if we do it like them, it can happen. And also, I'd like to point out that that Luton managed to do this rise from non-league. Just yeah, there. yeah, just all the way through. Is it um, after that awful injustice of a thirty-point deduction? I mean, a thirty-point deduction. You may as well relegate a team. I mean, that was <laughs> that was outrageous, wasn't it? Just, wasn't I, it? I think I saw somewhere as well that Pelly Roddick became the first player to ever go from non-league to the Premier League with the same team as well. Like just a ridiculous statistic. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, was it Steve Finnan went from not like non-league and played all the way through? I think he played all the way through up to the Premier League, but not with the same team but yeah that's Penny Rack and Pansy crazy absolutely brilliant but Sheffield Wednesday promoted up into the championship alongside Ipswich Town and Plymouth Argyle they're going to be playing second tier football again next season after the most dramatic of late winners against Barnsley at Wembley let's drop down and take a look at the world's best fourth tier League 2 playoff final Carlisle United won, Stockport County won after extra time. Carlisle United win 5-4 on penalties. The Messiah becomes the king. Brunton Park is back in the League One family. Paul Simpson, love him. You should have uh, backed him in the semi-finals, James. I'm going to get on to this. You picked <laughs> Bradford, we all heard it. Yeah, it was reverse psychology. That's not how, I'm not having an excuse. <laughs> I did. I actually, I actually said that. I'm doing this for you, Carlisle fans. I'm backing Bradford. <laughs> and it works. It works a treat. You, you know? should have backed. He, he didn't start. say that. I, I did. I did Why don't you just back Carlisle from the start? Go with your heart, James. Come on. Yeah. Every time I do that, I get heartbroken, and so I don't. No, I that's don't only with Walsall, not with Carlisle. That's different. <laughs> no, that's that's just my. I, I get paid by Aston Villa and Wolves fans a, a monthly stipend to make sure that I keep backing Walsall as my dark horse team. <laughs> Team news for this game, Carlisle make one change to the team which won the second leg against Bradford City. That change is an enforced one. It was defender Ben Barkley, the man whose extra time goal booked Carlisle's place in this final. 
he's unable to play against his parent club in Stockport County. So he swapped out for John Mellish back from a three game suspension and back into the fence alongside Paul Huntington and Corey Whelan. Thomas Holly playing wasn't goal his behind best them. Game, though, was it? Who would turn to it? Mellish wasn't his best game, was it? I thought he did right. He was fine. He, 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 he wasn't so happy with his deflection. That's not. That's, that's what we're true. referring to. That's mean. Come on. I mean, then you get the card afterwards, but certainly not the best game you could have. He's an all-action player. Point, He's but... going to pick up cards. <laughs> I thought he was pretty, pretty, um, pretty strong in the field. To be fair. <laughs> I thought he did as well. Jack Armour and Joel Senior retain their places at wing back. Callum Guy, Owen Moxon, and Alfie McCallum on the midfield three. Joe Garner, partnered by John Kimani Gordon up top. For Stockport, two changes from the second leg team at Edgley Park. Ben Hinchcliffe still in goal. Akil Wright moved back into the fence alongside Fraser Horsell and Chris Hussey. Ryan Rydell and Carl Noy retain their place at left and right wing back, respectively. Anthony Sarsvik and Ryan Crosdale brought into the midfield three alongside Callum Camps, Paddy Mann and Isaac Oluwathi leading the line in a 3-5-2. This was a Wembley game that two of us on this call were at. Myself was in with the Cumbrians. Christopher was in with the Hatters. We had a long afternoon at Wembley, Chris. That was a real slog in some ways through 120 minutes of football and a penalty shootout. And then one of us stayed even longer than the other did. I knew I'd picked the right side when I went with that Carlisle ticket. So happy I got to enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, it was a good day out. Um, bit, bit of a family link with, uh, with Stockport for me. So I was in the uh, in the Stockport end and you know, it was a cracking day out. And even despite the loss, everyone sort of went away feeling that County had given, given it they're all on the day, giving it all over the season. They'd have, they've had a fantastic few years and didn't feel it was unjust. I mean, they, they, Carlisle and County were tight through the season, tight on the day and ultimately denied by a sort of slightly mediocre penalty and a pretty good save. So I, I, I don't think anyone felt too heartbroken in the end. I say I did have a good day. I did make one mistake, though. I really, really wish I picked a different ticket category. I do not like being ground level at football matches. It works fine to some. Some like it. Not for me. I hate that I can't get a sense of the depth of the pitch when the ball's at the far end. I absolutely hate it. And that is to the <laughs> fact that because you're down at the front, you're in, you guys have been to Wembley will know, you're in the shallow rows up at the front of the bottom yep. tier. And it's just not ideal when you've got people in front of you getting up out of the seat every time you get into the final third or even close to goal. So you're left with that classic problem where you've got to get up in order to see the over the people in front of you, and then you've got the people behind you telling you to sit down because they can't see. <laughs> There's just no winning in situations like this, and it's because of that problem that, to be honest, I wasn't able to see as much of the first half live as I probably would have wanted to. Chris, I know you... Stay standing at Wembley, that's what we need. I, Chris, I, 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 there was actually I, I, a stay standing section, I think, up towards the back of the top bottom tier, I think. Was there? Chris, I know you were up in the second tier, and I really wish I'd done the same, just paid a little bit more and got a much better view... And all my problems would have gone away. I must admit, I didn't intend to go in that section. I, I probably would have maybe not got the, the bottom tier, but probably would have got the, the sort of second level up uh, tickets. But a couple of friends had already bought their tickets and gone in that section. So I thought, why not? And it was really lovely. I mean, the, the seats were cushioned uh, at half time. It's the executive area normally. I think it is, yeah. yeah. The, at half time, uh, it was quite easy to go out and get a pint and you didn't have to queue for hours to go to the loo. It was... It was, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, Wembley learning curve for me. Lessons to learn next year when it's Gilling and Vitrami Rovers there. <laughs> I, I found it quite... Like, there's a, there was a few tweets um, after the game about the lack of a crowd and these aren't well-supported teams. And I, I have to be honest, I used to do the attendances on our Twitter page and I stopped doing it because I got actually, frankly, exhausted and bored of people claiming that they're such a big club because they got such a load of support. I mean, just... Hold them, just, hold them, hold them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people Sorry, to, which league are you in? <laughs> people people need to like stop with this nonsense football is not won because you have a big crowd and frankly i thought it was a good effort on a on a on a early kickoff game very like awkward kickoff time that on a sunday yeah it's like it was still a decent crowd wasn't there thirty five thousand or something i mean for the fourth tier as well yeah in 2008 when county were last there against rochdale it was thirty five thousand. it was thirty four thousand yesterday it cost me to get down from leeds 100 quid return on the train um there, there were and no people trains, came even further than that there were no trains running from um stockport from carlisle there was an electric failure on the train so a lot of them had to get on in leeds um it was a nightmare traveling so anyone claiming that that's not a good good support on the day can frankly shove it 
well it's, i just find it a tedious argument these days like it's just like these are these are James, most of the people who celebrate crowds don't have anything else to celebrate all them all them all them <laughs> see what i mean yeah exactly. <laughs> Truth yeah, is, yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier, I don't think I actually missed that much in the first half not being able to see because the game as a whole really, I thought it was fairly low on actual high quality. The big moment of that first 45 no, was a Stockport goal, 34th minute, ball worked out to the right with Isaac Oluwafe, faces up to John Mellish, has a shot and it takes the cruelest of deflections off Mellish, looping right over the top of Thomas Holly and into the net. That hurt watching that. That was really painful. My friend was uh, celebrating like mad because he thought um, Oluwafi had, um, had chipped it. <laughs> but it's like, That's I, not I did at first think that when I saw the shot and I thought, there's no way he's chipped him from there. He wouldn't be no playing chance. League 2 football if he had that in his life. <laughs> no, that was, it was a horrible goal. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing Thomas Holy could do about that. I, was watching, I watched the replay and I was like, that's just one of those things, isn't it? it you, you can't, you can't it's, legislate it's, for it's it. Maybe the fact as well, it's looped over a guy in Holly who is an absolute giant He's yeah, huge. Yeah. It's just painful. It's really painful to even think back on it, watching it now. Oh. I, I thought if this is the winning goal, it's it's a cruel twist. I'll isn't tell it? me about it. I I didn't really enjoy the next hour of the day or so, to be honest, because Carlisle didn't look like they were actually going to hurt Stockport enough until eight yard minutes. So, like you, James, really, I was there thinking, oh, that's not actually going to win this game, is it? That cruel deflection is going to be what decides this. And I mean, playoff final defeats are hard enough to take as it is, and. Stockport probably could have had another Chris because I remember a really good chance to rack all right around 57 minutes from a header. He should have oh, scored. He, he should oh. have buried that. And there, and there was another another one quite late on. I can't remember who hit it from the edge of the area and, and Holy pulls off. Stratton. Yeah, Jack Stratton. Jack, yeah. Jack Stratton, yeah. Carlisle what, guy as well. What a hell of a save. Um, and, the, oh, and there was a slightly audacious um, overhead kick as well tried at one point. Yes, yeah, Hippolyte, I remember that. Yeah, I mean... He, he went through it and I thought, that's going to connect that. He's going to meet that. Yeah. And it, I had a moment of panic where I thought I was going in. I thought Thomas Holly was uh, was really good on the day. Because I was slightly confused for a moment why there was a Czech flag in the, the track Carlisle end and then it sort of clicked for me. Maybe there's a Czech Republic fan club in Carlisle? Or, no, well, mo- no Thomas, wait. Thomas, let me try. <laughs> Thomas Did Holly I just say is, uh... Czech Republic fan club in Carlisle? I meant wrong, Carlisle man. fan club in Czech Republic. <laughs> They, well, they do have a impressive fans, don't they, Carlisle? They have an impressive group of fans in the capital, which is uh, is well known. Which is uh, not Simpsons, surprised. Simpsons changes. They did make the difference in this game in the second half. Amari Patrick and Ryan Edmonton have been brought on around the hour. Uh, Jordan Gibson came on. Taylor Charters came on. Christian Dennis went on. Mm-hmm. Carlisle, one nil down, essentially went 4-2-4 four, four and about as attack heavy as you possibly can. Charters was in at left back. Mellish was in midfield alongside Moxon. Mellish in midfield, by the way, is everywhere. It's absolutely ridiculous how he seems to be on one side of the pitch and the other just back and forth so constantly. Patrick High up on the left, Gibson up on the right, Dennis and Edmonton up top. It's not long after Dennis comes on that we get a frantic 90-second period in front of that Carlisle end. Edmonton with the ball into the box, low cut back to Mellish, shots blocked on the line by Carl Noyle. Stockport look to counter, that attack breaks down, Carlisle then go again. Get it out to Gibson on the right. Joel Senior at right back flies past him. He's fed the ball, puts a low cross across the box. Edmondson has the ball taken off him, but it falls perfectly to Amari Patrick. And the finish is just beautiful. Perfect, wasn't it? Absolutely yeah. perfect finish. Yeah, that 90 second sequence is up on Carlisle United's Twitter, by the way. Well worth a watch. It just brilliantly sums up the pain and joy of a playoff file. Oh, I love celebrating so that goal, sickening. Chris. It was so good. It was so sickening <laughs> down the other end. It was it was one of those like your stomach just falls. It's just horrible. <laughs> Cause I, it, I, mean, I can't was, say I felt the same way. It, it's it's amazing how how loud Wembley is even when it's only a third full. Yeah, it's good good it's good uh, autistics, isn't it? In there in um, oh, autistic. <laughs> autistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I mean. like, <laughs> we can I'm tell us leave the that last in. One, can't we? <laughs> you know it's the last one. <laughs> It's it's my um, it's my home life. I tell you, with my autistic children, it's been a uh, it's been a trying while, I should say. Yeah, so I, it's kind of on my mind. Would you mind like to try that time. sentence again? I'll let someone else take over. Yeah, it's, I it's mean, one, the acoustics. Acoustic. Yeah, the acoustics. Yeah. Acoustic. <laughs> the acoustics. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 it's a great stadium. I actually was fortunate enough to get a pretty high up on the halfway line position when Oxford got promoted against York, and it was a great experience. And I can only imagine for those Carlisle fans. Just, you know, because it didn't look like they were going to score and to suddenly be level. 
and then to go on to to, to win the game. I, I was going to ask you, Ed, you were down the end, mm-hmm. I think, wasn't it? Where that yep. was it a handball in the from from the shot that just moments before. I'll be honest, the hand is away from me. My instinct at the time is that it's just off the line. I'm just devastated that they missed the opportunity because it felt like a really good one. Little did I know that within 60 seconds, they get the goal anyway. I didn't think anything of a handball at the time. It, they it, never I, actually showed a replay of it. I was so on the other end and I, I, saw, I, I saw Carl Alphan shouting for it, but... No, I remember the radio commentator was saying, like, it's got to be handball. That, but I, like I said, I don't think I saw a replay of it. So well, it was wondering. VAR, so surely that would have... Well, yeah, it's, I think it's, I think it's, his hand, his arm was in a natural position, so. God, so we'd have had something to say about VAR if Amari Patrick's goal had been ruled out, so they could go back to a car. <laughs> if if I'd done that celebration I did, and it went to VAR, I would have screamed. No, I don't want to pull up with that. <laughs> have I mentioned to you guys? Um, Not you and Will Volk sharing that. <laughs> while we're on this, have I mentioned to you guys that Paul Simpson played for Oxford in the eighties, <laughs> early nineties? Just, where, just where did he play, just James? He was a winner. Yeah, he was, he was like the prodigy. He had he, he was uh, he was the sort of mentor for our geniuses that were Joey Beecham and Chrissy Allen. Yeah, he, he was a he was a player for Oxford. I don't think I've mentioned it on this podcast. I just thought I'd bring it up seeing as this is the last one. Um, and he's going to be knighted soon, I think, isn't he? I think I saw. Well, I think can, I saw can you knight a king? Oh uh, well. Can you give a king a knighthood? I don't know. I, th- I think he should. Maybe you can make him like Lord Emperor of the entire. <laughs> world universe Just like ruler, of, ruler of the universe really yeah chris how did you find extra time two key Hell. second half saves you said it thomas holly from stretton which i think was in the 17th minute and there was one the 20 seconds of hinchcliffe where he's basically just palmed a corner a very short corner away it, it slightly blurred it was just nervy yeah um yeah. I, I think I, I i felt stockport were gonna nick it but i think that was more of blind optimism than anything rational once it got into the second half i was thinking yeah this is going all the way yeah, yeah. I think, I think once it got to half time, I was starting to think. And th- there's something about Stockport. And this is a bit mean because I do think Stretton can become a good player, but they do feel weaker when it's only him up top. When they it, had Madnoth and Oluwathi off, it just doesn't feel the same level of threat with Stretton at the moment. I, 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 I yeah. didn't fully get mm-hmm. the, Mad- the Madden substitution, actually. I mean, I, I can only assume that it's um, an injury issue because he was out the other week. I didn't get that one, and then I didn't get the Sarsovic substitution either. Well, I did wonder because you know I think you dropped it in the in the chat, Chris, when it went to penalties that those Madden and Sarsovic were off, and I thought, oh, this is yeah, perhaps advantage Carlisle a little bit just it, because those guys are quite regular in the spot kicks, aren't they? Because the, the the Madden one I sort of put down to oh he must be he must be injured or something because he, he has had a bit of a knock recently, hasn't he? But the Sarsovic one because he went off in about what was it 100 and it felt like 118 or something. It was really quite late. Uh, oh, 114. Um, I, I didn't get that one because it felt like it was inevitable it was going to penalties he, he, he and has you want someone that... lacked a lot of match fitness recently he's not yeah, been involved you... in a lot of match day squads you surely want him for the penalties though at that point if, if you've got him through that far but you are bringing on Lemony Evans mm, it's essentially true. like for like I would say really yeah yeah probably yeah. I just uh, it just it was a, it was just great to see Carlisle end up Winning the shootout and, and getting promoted. Five four I mean, penalty shootout win. The only save Ryan Rydell, Thomas Holly denying him, and I think really from that point, us in that car then kind of knew, yeah, th- this is going to happen. And there's something beautiful, James, about how the final penalty taker is Taylor Charters, one of their own. Wasn't it just yeah, one of their own? Yeah. Look, all, every club takes a lot of pride in the homegrown players, understandably so. But there's yeah. something about Carlisle. Every single time they have a Cumbrian in that squad, or even a Cumbrian who goes on to do other great things at other clubs, they take such immense pride in players from their region. I think it's it, they are quite isolated regionally, aren't they, in the country? No one can deny that. And I think that's, you know, I know from speaking to some of the people who've been in charge of recruitment up there and that, it, it, it is a challenge. You know, yeah. people forget, like, getting players to come to them when there's all those clubs sort of around Greater Manchester – it's a it is a massive massive ordeal trying to get those players to go up there and and the few that do agree to go up and and move their entire life up there in football at, in the low league level it's so insecure you get a one year contract two if you're very lucky uh, three year contracts are almost unheard of I mean you know and that is why they have those issues of trying to to build a sustainable squad and getting these young players coming through from their region who often go on to do like you say really good things um, is so important to them and. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just delighted for them because I think as well, we, we forget that Carlisle, although we had them like quite low in our predictions, 18th, I think. I mean, 
there's a reason for that, and that is because they still have a bottom six budget in League Two. Completely winless. Um, you know, they have the the challenges of uh, the the ownership not being. You know, they're kind of gatekeepers. Those owners at the moment, they're not there. They haven't got one of these. Um, I don't know what you call it, like sugar daddies that you get at quite a lot of clubs. I mean, Stockport are very wealthy, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and so that is that is a massive challenge. You know, they have the regional challenge. They have the the financial challenge. Brunton Park's a big old ground, which is quite expensive to upkeep. They've had issues with flooding over the years as well. You know, so Paul Simpson comes in there and changes a team that were in the relegation zone when he arrived to one that in not very, you know, not very long at all. He's got them fighting for promotion, automatic promotion throughout the entire season. And what a fantastic job he's done. I mean, you know, taking my Paul Simpson bias hat off, just from a, a objective point of view, what a fantastic job he has he done. He has got 20 goals out of Christian Dennis. He has turned Owen Moxham, a Cumbrian player, into a Thortis superstar this season. He has been so good. Paul Huntington, another Cumbrian, rock solid at the back. Mellish has been brilliant. Thomas Holly has been brilliant. He's had to adapt to this injury list that we talked about across the whole season as well. So many different players have had to go right wing back, for instance. And he's overcome it all. And I really do not think this season happens without him. I think, it, honestly think, if you gave that group, that situation to any other manager in this league, they don't do what Simpson's done. No. And he's, really he's local lad that. as well, isn't he? Which is even better. Like, well, that's Paul Simpson. There is a statue of Hugh McElmore outside Brunton Park, and uh, I think he needs some company. And I I completely agree. Three promotions now with his hometown team, and a former Stockport manager. Yeah, I mean it's funny though. Like um, Ollie from the Southcast, you know, was talking to me about Paul Simpson quite some time ago now. But you're saying that he was he was really poor in his time at Salop, and he, he made the quite succinct point yesterday when when Carlisle got promoted that you should never write off a manager just because he has one bad experience at a club because often the, the yeah. circumstances around that. But managers don't – it's a very risky business being a manager. Like, you don't often get second chances. And Paul Simpson just – you know, he's had a wonderful coaching career and he's a very personable guy as well. Like, the players speak so highly of him as what he's like as a character. And you can see it. I mean, he was a as – a, as a footballer, he was a great guy as well. He's a really nice character. I mean, I've spoken to players who played with him back in the days for Oxford and – they, they've all spoken so highly of him and you can see why he's just you know he, he the way he deals with his players his man management's been man management has been exceptional i mean i, I can't yeah you know, and just i love the fact that carlisle have gone up i'm a big fan of carlisle and also i had a great season with them a few esl years if you make carlisle v burton a tuesday night we're gonna fall out <laughs> i really want to get to the brunton park for a weekend game Please. Uh, no, I think I, I beg have you. booked their yes. uh, trip on the Tuesday night to Carlisle, actually. I was going to say, it's, it's, got, it's, got to, it's got to be Exeter or... Exeter to Carlisle on Tuesday. It's, it's just going to happen, isn't it? Of course. Harry, David, Stockport County back in League Two next season. Have you guys looked at that Thor-tier lineup yet? Because uh, that is one tasty-looking promotion battle next season in the Thor-tier. There are a serious number of good candidates there. Looking forward to it, mate. Looking forward to it. I feel like both of our teams as well like could to provide some interesting standpoints. Obviously, with the two teams that are coming up from the National League in Wrexham and Notts County, clearly a lot of fans um, that think they're just going to walk the league. Um, but having looked at it on face value, I feel like it's almost, to me, League Two next year is going to be what League One has been for the last couple of years. And what I mean by that I is that. just about six or seven teams that are just going to be vying. And I imagine about six or seven that have already hit their hopes on having automatic promotion. Now, let's be honest, guys. We know that League Two has been stupidly tight for the last couple of seasons, but I'm just not quite sure how anything gets topped um, compared to the last few seasons. But if there's if there's a chance of anything like that happening, you know, we've... With, I suppose, you know, you've got to include the likes of Wrexham and Notts County coming up. You know, the, the Wrexham budget isn't something to be sniffed at. You've got to look at the takeover at Gillingham. Like, you know, understandably, I'm going to be a bit um, optimistic based on end of season form. You know, there's there's plenty of teams that are going to be offering Bradford a fight in there. there. Salford all, in all there. three playoff sides will go again. Wrexham and Notts will want back to back. You've got Mansfield in the mix. Milkins Dons have hired Gary Alexander. Not Gary Alexander. Graham Alexander, Graham sorry. Alexander. Gary Alexander. Don, Don <laughs> Costa Doncaster Harry hiring McCann Graham well. McCann, Jills with Harris. There's bound to be a couple of surprise packages, Harry. I'm I'm quite bullish on Barrow and Pete Wilde. I'll happily admit that right now. Yeah, if they can hold on to Pete Wilde, definitely. They're one to watch out for again next year, aren't they? I think Colchester as well. I, I think he'll be interesting. 
if they have anything like the January they had this summer, then absolutely, I think they'll be well up there. Like it, it's it's one of those opportunities, really, isn't it, where you could pick any one of those teams to be up there, but the chances are is it's going to be nowhere. Let's be honest, if any of us pick it, it's going to be nowhere near like <laughs> that anyway. Um, you, we, we've seen that with Carlisle in itself, haven't we, this season, where you know we've kind of picked them to be in a completely different position. But some of those teams, like they get that summer right. And I guess we were talking about it in League One as well. Some of those mid-table teams get that summer right and there, there could be some big upsets in both divisions next I'm year. I'm generally fascinated what Crawley do next year because surely they can't go that bad again. It's a big uh, summer, isn't it? I I'm think pretty much the only, the only certainty coming into next year is that Mansfield are going to just about mess out on the playoffs again. Yeah. <laughs> death, death taxes. I wonder. I'm beginning to wonder if Thoris Green might go back to back. Oh, yeah, I mean, so poor under Ferguson. That's the thing. It's it's so tough to call at the top. But I was looking at it, and I think it's the first time in a few years where there's not two obvious teams that are going to struggle next year. Crawley obviously have a big question mark hanging over them, but in theory, the money's there. They've they maybe they've learnt their lesson, and and they're going to turn things around there. I'm um, optimistic. Forest Green, I agree, I do worry about. Morecambe, I was very worried about, but then they've just come out and and supposedly they're going to have a much bigger budget well, next they've, season. Well, they've got to make a squad because everyone's gone. Well, yeah, they've also said they've also said that their budget's bigger than it was when they were when last they won in League promotion. 2. When it was £10. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's £11 but, now. It, it, it should be bigger than it was last time. <laughs> Everything costs more. Mm. Yeah, exactly. AC Wimbledon are on a slump, by the way, lads. They couldn't buy a stick of butter with their previous budget now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Wimbledon's end of their season wasn't exactly covering themselves in glory, was and it? And James will have teams. all sorts of playoffs again and see them come 17th. <laughs> <laughs> playoffs? What are talking about? Automatics, mate. It's playoffs. <laughs> Can't win the league. But yeah, it's a tough one to call. I mean, there's there's so much money there at the top now, isn't there? And and like you say, the Wrexham. two teams that are coming up are... are yeah, a authority big rivalry with Wrexham. Yeah, of course, yeah. I'd love to say I'm looking forward to it. Oh, it's a horrible I'm away end. I'm going to wait and see the design first. <laughs> it's, it's a horrible away end. You see, and they've got new floodlights, by the way, Wrexham. They had them for a Kings of Leon concert recently, and they, they kind of like different parts of them light at the same time. You create like spiral effects, which would be quite fun on Tuesday nights when they get goals. Why? <laughs> Why have they done that? Because it's Wrexham, because they can't. They're rebuilding the cop. They're a three side stadium at the minute. We've got them, Mansfield, and Oxford in the football league at the moment. Yeah, but... I can't wait for us to leave the Kassam. That'd be a joyous <laughs> day. <laughs> League one done, league two done. Lads, that's us done. D three D four football. James, we owe this all to you. You are the man who started us up several years ago now and I'd I'd love you to just take the mic really and, and tell us all about your feelings on what has just been a, a really brilliant ride. Yeah. Um it's it's kind of a heavy heart really to say goodbye to something that you've built from scratch and you think there's been such a big part of my life but I think I'm at a stage now getting a bit older and my kids are a bit older and this this was a wonderful sort of distraction for me when my, my kids were little and they were keeping me away like every hour you can imagine I mean they still do frankly but that's never going to change with two autistic children I, I just yeah it's just been something that I've been a passion had a passion for for years I mean being an Oxford fan we spent, let's re- be honest, pretty much most of my adult life in the lower tiers of this in the English football. We've been into the National League as well. And it wasn't getting anywhere near the kind of coverage it is now, um, especially kind of like on social media and with, with all these fan sites and fan podcasts. Now, they, they've kind of sprung up since we've started. And that's really good to see. I, I really feel that um, the sort of the development of, of fan media has been brilliant to watch, especially for these lower leagues. I hope... I hope we do see at some point, and I think with this new Sky deal, there's there's promise in it that we might see much more live League One and Two football shown on TV. Mm. I'm a bit worried about that in some respects as well, in terms of you know how that will develop with crowds and develop with uh, with how it financially hits clubs. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff in football and in the globe and in the world, especially our country in general, which is worrying at the moment. I think, but I hope football does remain such an important integral part our pyramid is something to be admired something to be protected and something that um is just so much fun to cover and you guys you say you you are all to me i mean frankly i've, I've kind of trapped you on to, <laughs> roped you into this uh this <laughs> weekly podcast for like the last over more than half a decade to talk about 
well, let's be honest, it sometimes is quite attritional football. <laughs> Um, but it's great. It's it really is, and you know, as I say, I leave oh, it. I, I love watching Mike Fondot play. Of course, who doesn't? Agree with that at all. Chris, yeah, me, too, I mean, me too. To be fair, I, I'm not going to argue with that. I love Fondot. It's great. It's been great, and you know, uh, I think all of you will agree that um, each club. I mean, each club is so important to its community. Uh, there are some really good owners um, in the EFL. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of them in our divisions as well, who are to making inroads. I mean, we've had some pretty dark times with the likes of Berry going and Macclesfield going, and I, I really do hope football has learned its lesson, but I, I do have concerns whether that will ever be the case. But we'll have to wait and see what happens with with all the reforms that we're meant to have in football. But generally speaking, I, I'm very proud of what D3D4 has done. I really appreciate all the people who've given us their ear uh, and listened to this podcast over the years. I mean, you know, we do, we do like I'm now, rambling on. You know, it's it's... It's been great. And a big thank you to Ed for, for hosting it so ably and taking it to another level uh, in recent years. Chris, for your loyalty, mate, you've been here from almost the start. Luke, for starting it up with me. Mm. Harry and David, you've been excellent voices added to this. So, you know, just brilliant, all of you. Thank you so much. There's been a lot of voices on this podcast. Uh, we've all varied in terms of our length involvement. James, from the very start. Chris, yourself. Can you really remember a time when you started out with this? I remember... Um... James wrote an article about Oldham, um, I guess one of the early ones on the website, uh, and I, I can't remember if I just retweeted it or if I commented on it or, or what, uh, but I, I got a message from him going, oh, we're looking for someone to, to talk and write a bit about Oldham, are, are you interested? And I thought, yeah, why not, give it a crack, it'd be, be something to do, be good fun, and it, it sort of grew from there, I ended up popping up on the um, the odd podcast as a guest, and then uh, Luke got his, uh, his job at Cheltenham and I ended up sort of taking over from him and my involvement grew from there and then over the last couple of years similar to James I think I've not not quite had the same same amount of time for it but it's always been a nice nice thing to sort of look forward to on a Sunday It's an morning, iconic just... fact that you went to Antarctica and back in Wimbledon didn't win in that period. <laughs> it's forever That's iconic great. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, our trip down to Exeter, I remember that as well. That was that was actually was one of my favourite drives I've done. I don't know. That was a cracking day. You came yeah. down on the coach. I came down to meet you and on the car, and I, I had no problems on my journey at all. You looked absolutely knackered when you got. Off the- <laughs> oh yeah, because well, that was um that was when we had it was that season where we we'd started off with Frankie Bunn, we'd won at Fulham, and then Pete Wilde had come in, then Paul Scholes, and then Pete Wilde finished the season, and we had sort of. It, I think we had to beat Exeter and a couple of other teams had to lose or draw and we'd sneak into the playoffs. So I'd sort of made a decision a couple of days before, right, there's one place left on the on the club coach. Let's go for it. Now, the one seat left on the club coach ended up being right next to the toilets. Um, so that was a very, very long trip down from Oldham to Exeter on the coach. Um, but yeah, met James there. We, we got a picture with Pete Wilde and and that was a that was a lovely day out, and uh, James's wife made me a really good selection of butties for the drive back, which I'm forever thankful for. Yeah, yeah, and we also went to Blackpool. Actually, I forget we did that as well. When Oxford. we did, yeah, and and we got I got a selfie. Me and Chris got a selfie, and some guy behind had a massive blow up penis, which was just like <laughs> photo bomb. <laughs> photo bomb coming out. This year. I I had a weird one once at Latics where I was um. I was uh, with my partner and we were sat in the main stand at Oldham um, and someone taps me on the shoulder and goes, are you Chris Stringer? I go, yeah. He goes, I thought I recognised your voice and turned around properly and he was in one of the only D3D4 Oldham Athletic t-shirts. That oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. We sold a couple of them, didn't we? Yeah. I, I remember how this started for me and it starts the way you always want an opportunity to start with an anonymous phone call in the middle of nowhere i was at the, <laughs> i was at the manchester christmas market in december 2019 i think it would have been and james just rang me completely out of the blue i'm still not entirely sure where he got my number from <laughs> or how he managed to get in contact with me i think i asked you for it to be fair i don't, I, think I I did don't remember i don't remember that i don't remember <laughs> I just remember getting this number. Sounds like the start of a horror film. <laughs> it does actually, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it, it's ended up, it's not ended up growing into a film, it's ended up growing into a love story, really. And uh, I, I remember Are getting... Are you announcing like... something here? No, 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 no,
You ruined my moment here, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Join that there. It's going to get all sentimental and everything. I remember the opportunity. He, he gave me the opportunity. I think it was December 2019 when I first got involved. I think it was a couple of guys you had involved. I, I took one the first one. I remember really liking it. And we just kept the, the interest really growing from there. And at the time, I was working for a company where my focus was basically almost exclusive on League 2 so I had a good understanding of that quite a limited level to League 1 not the same level I, I certainly do now and what I, I realised certainly under you James is just how good both these leagues are just how incredibly entertained they are how much drama they provide every single opportunity how there's so much value I think in actually learning about these players because you do actually see a lot of them go on to the very big time and become really big household names across the country and it's it's quite great to look back on some of those figures someone like Ollie Watkins for instance at Aston Villa and think I remember you at Exeter when you started out working your way up from there and seeing the level they're at now someone like Scott Twine for instance just got promoted to the Premier League with Burnley and we we saw him on loan at Newport County and got the sense even then about the player he, he could become it's it's the growth of these kind and to be able to take the reins over from you and take it on has been a blast these last two years and you, you've got to find yourself a career in this mate I mean you know my, I'm my my opportunities my time is 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 come and gone I think for you though um you you've got you've just got this natural ability on this pod to the way you talk, the way you present it, your knowledge is is fantastic. You see and the cold sweat a, I'm on right now. Yeah, no, you just you're superb. Probably you just tiring, definitely definitely deserve ed. something. Give him a job. Sky yeah. Sports, higher higher ed is your new Not after what I've said tweets I've said about them, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly not. David, two years, I believe, we've had you. Two years, yeah, man. What a crazy two years it's been. I think similar to similar to Chris in some respects, the first time I started doing this um, was just sort of interacting with the, the Twitter page a, a good few times, kind of for a period of time. And then uh, James was looking for a Gillingham fan to do the end of season um, review. So I jumped on on that. And then uh, a little bit later on, um kind of a bit more interaction and then one day just out of the blue just the message being like um you know we're looking for someone to make some contributions to the sunday podcast something i'd you know found just randomly um just scrolling through looking for some football content just randomly scrolling through found the podcast started listening to it intently um and honestly you guys are just fascinating like when you're not part of it and i'd you know it's easy to say this when you're only two years down the line but when you're not a part of it and you're listening and even the episodes you miss, like it's fascinating to hear the knowledge and the depth in which you guys had and, and to be asked to be a part of um, something with, you know, three people or, you know, obviously the three of you and then, and now um, Harry as well, like with your knowledge and your, on your depth of character as well as, as people, um, you know, yeah, it's just it's just a real honour to have been asked to do this. And I, I just don't feel like it's something that this is going to sound really stupid, but I just don't feel like it's something that people like me get to do. I, I don't like when I started this, I didn't really have much knowledge of the divisions. And if I'm perfectly honest, I don't have much better knowledge now, but I certainly have much more of an idea now than I did. Um And if not for you guys, I mean, the appreciation for the divisions was there from from my supporting of Gillingham, but I guess you guys have just shown me a whole different way and a whole different light of the way that things can be and the way that, you know, you don't even necessarily have to meet people in life to have some wonderful friendships. Um, so for that, um, I'm really appreciative of all of you. So uh, thank you for just, you know, giving me the time of day and, and giving me this opportunity because um, my, you guys have changed my life in ways that you'll never understand. Steve Evans must oh, be so that. proud to have you as your agent. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i think i think we do owe harry an apology though because his team was actually quite good before he joined the pod um much like so Chris's was actually. mine I'll, I'll, I'll mine, got mine. <laughs> mine got relegated i got i am i am gonna happily admit i think we have been a burden on our own quantities because we've had relegation <laughs> battles in all of our debut seasons and even harry's has tailed off the, towards the end the first the first few times i was on the podcast i was discussing the possibility of Oldham playing championship <laughs> football <laughs> I That's think, I think to be fair, when I got involved, Chris Burton was just around the League One playoffs and they've not been back yeah. since. Yeah, but, yeah, but, 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 but Burton didn't finish 12th in the National League this season. That's we true. just finished 
10th twice back to back in a really competitive league one. And I was thinking, all right, we'll crack on and maybe break into the playoffs. Or there was the potential for that. <laughs> we got relegated the next year awfully. Like, I'm, I'm telling you now, how old we're going up next season. It's because we're not doing this podcast anymore. <laughs> Shillingham will make the playoffs next year because we're not doing it. Burton and Oxen will make the playoffs next year. It'll have nothing to do with anything else. It'll just be the fact that we've stopped doing this. Indeed. <laughs> Harry, you, you were one of my recruits. We uh, we looked around for another guy to join the team. And I remember you always standing out from the start, really. You demonstrated to me very early on that you had a really strong passion, understanding for these divisions and to have you involved for as long as you had, even if it is a short time compared to the rest of us. It's been an absolute pleasure to see that you've been part of this. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. I feel the, the same way as David, really. Um, I felt like I didn't know a huge amount about the two leagues coming in. Then I felt like I knew a bit more when I started researching them. And then I started talking to you guys and I realised I didn't know a single thing compared to how much you know. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been incredible. Like you say, it's it's a shame for me that it's not been longer, but what a brilliant few months. I've learned so much from all of you. I've had an absolute blast being part of this every Sunday. It's become such an important staple of my week. Uh, and I, yeah, I've just, just loved it, learned a huge amount. Um, and very grateful to have been able to contribute a little bit uh, to the people listening out there. Um, like James alluded to there, I probably will never forgive you for the fact that Tramir had won five games on the bounce. Oh, God, they had as well. <laughs> and, then, and then I came in for my first episode and I had to wait about three months to talk about it. <laughs> it's actually um, real. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I was quite lucky as well because, like you mentioned, Ed, um, for those who don't know, Ed, Ed just put a tweet out saying we're looking for somebody new to join the podcast and so I sent him a message and said I'd be interested Um sort of had a bit of a chat about it. And he said, can you come on on this episode? So I came on and I thought, oh, brilliant. I've got a place on on the podcast. And then a couple of weeks later, he sent me another message and said, we've had a chat about it and we'd like you to to come back. And I was like, oh, right. OK, I'm glad I didn't know that interview. <laughs> oh, no. oh, wait, you weren't even aware that was a. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's a good job. oh. <laughs> No, that's something new. Okay. Good job it went well. But um <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's it's been a real privilege to be a part of and uh yeah, I'm I'm sure that though this is the end of the podcast, I hope that it, it's not the end of uh of, of everybody here's careers really. I'm I'm very excited to see where you all go on from here and, and I'm sure we'll all stay in touch and uh yeah, laugh when uh, when Oldham don't make the playoffs again next year and have another year in non league. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was enjoying your comments until then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm most grateful to Harry for coming with me to Fleetwood when Burton won in the 96th minute. So that was the moment where Harry and I got to meet. And uh, you better be back there next year, Harry. Oh yeah, don't you worry about it. Just Good. as soon as you sent my ticket over. <laughs> <laughs> Time to wrap this up for good. It has been one brilliant ride, one brilliant experience to be part of. Thank you to every one of you for listening. Thank you to every one of you who has taken part over the years. On behalf of all of us, it has been a pleasure to guide you through to the end of yet another brilliant season down in League One and League Two. All that I've got left to say really is one thing, one request. Keep the love growing. From when this podcast started to where we leave it now, the level of coverage, the level of care... The level of love for the lower leagues has grown just exponentially. We need to collectively make sure that growth never stops. All of you listening know, all of you following know, these are a pair of leagues that just never, ever fail to deliver. All the drama and action of the top levels with added competition and exceptional support across the board. I call them the world's best third and fourth tiers because it's what they are. You will not find lower league football with this level of quality and interest anywhere else on the planet. It is our duty as a whole to make everyone aware of it, to make everyone understand what is so special about it and to make everyone want to enjoy every single second of it. If you are one of the people whose love for the leagues has come through us, firstly, thank you. We are now passing the baton on to you. Go and take it the distance. Thank you once again for everything. Goodbye.